Okay, welcome back. It's time for lesson five. Today we're going to study the infinite square well, which is our first real system. Okay, so first of all, why study the infinite square well? The answer is because it's simple. Well, let's look. If you check in the text, you'll see problems that are worked out for the infinite square well, like this one. Doesn't that look simple? And then, of course, there's calculating Fourier coefficients for the infinite square well. That seems pretty simple. Then there's things like uh, building up superpositions of wave functions using the stationary states of the infinite square well. Kind of simple. And then, of course, there's testing for orthonormality of the stationary states of the infinite square well. That's looking really super simple. Okay, I think you get the idea. I'm, I'm kind of joking here. The math looks pretty hairy, but, uh, but the truth is it's not that bad if you can stick to the fundamentals. So what we want to do is keep our brains focused on the fundamental ideas and see if we can't use our comfort with those ideas to ease the pain of the otherwise sort of hideous calculus that we're going to run into. Just to recap, those ideas are the Einstein relation, the fact that frequency and energy are related to each other. We're going to find that the stationary states of the infinite square well each rotate with a different frequency, and that frequency is determined by the energy of the state. The de Broglie relation, the idea that momentum is related to the wave number k, and the wave numbers are determined by the requirement that the wave function fit inside the square well. Uh, that half that the width of the square well is either one half wavelength or two half wavelengths or three half wavelengths, just just like standing waves on a string. And the de Broglie relation tells us, given the wavelength, what the momentum associated with that, or what the magnitude of the momentum associated with that state might be. We're going to be focusing on the uncertainty principle. It turns out the uncertainty principle also relates the size of the well to the kind of momentum you expect to see, um, magnitude of momentum. We're going to be adding amplitudes together to get the total wave function, and we're going to be calculating probability densities by squaring the amplitude. So all those ideas are going to come back, and we're going to use them in the context of the infinite square well. If you solve the Schrodinger equation for the infinite square well, you get solutions that are sines and cosines. In fact, the time-independent Schrodinger equation for the infinite square well is exactly the same equation as you get when you solve for standing waves on a on a physical string stretched between two points. And I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with those. Uh, if you need help seeing how the solutions come about, please you know, ask, but, uh, but it's straightforward. The, uh, the stationary states are numbered. One, two, three, four, five, and so on. And you can see that the, that the number of each stationary state just corresponds to the number of half wavelengths that fit inside the well. I'm showing you examples for a well with a width of one unit, but of course you can have any well width, and that only affects the size of the, of the wavelengths. If you calculate probability densities, you do that by squaring these amplitudes. You'll notice that the probability densities uh, also kind of look like sines, except that they're shifted up. Um, they're like sine squareds, okay? So they have... Uh, well, you can see what they have. They have all positive values because probabilities have to be all positive real numbers. And so uh, the probability densities also have to be positive and real. But there are the first five stationary states corresponding probability densities. Okay, what are the important ideas here? Number one important idea is normalization. In other words, these states, although we know the solutions from the Schrodinger equation, in order to completely define them, we have to make sure they're normalized. So the idea is you start with an eigenstate, psi sub n. This is the spatial part of the time-independent Schrodinger equation, the solution to the Schrodinger equation. And uh, the factor in front of the x, I'm going to call that k sub n. It's n pi over a. It's uh, the required factor in order to make sure the sine function goes to 0 at the right edge of the well, assuming x starts at 0 on the left edge, all signs will go to 0 there, but the only way to get it to go to 0 at the other edge is to make sure that the wave number is an integer multiple of pi over a. So th that gives us our k sub n's. 
Anyway, to normalize it, we have to make sure that the probability density integrated across the well is 1. And you can see that's an easy integral to write down. Uh, sine squareds are easy integrals to do because sine squared always has a value, an average value of a half. So when you integrate over an integer number of half wavelengths, you get uh, 1 half times the size of the well. So it's uh, a over 2. So when you do the integral, you get 1 is equal to capital A squared times A over 2, and that means that capital A has to be the square root of 2 divided by the width of the well. So the normalization constant goes inversely like the square root of the width of the well. Okay, let's talk about energies of these states. You know, the only energy that there is is kinetic energy, because everywhere where there's potential energy, the wave function is zero. So the only energy we have to worry about is kinetic energy. The kinetic energy operator, we already know, is the uh, minus h bar squared over 2m times the second derivative with respect to x. That's the first term in the Schrodinger's equation we always write down. And uh, the psi sub n's are eigenstates of kinetic energy, of this kinetic energy operator. So that means it's easy to calculate the corresponding kinetic energy. We just apply the kinetic energy to one of our uh, eigenstates, one of our stationary states, and what we get out is the kinetic energy times the stationary state back again. So that means it's just got to be um, the momentum squared over 2m. Momentum, of course, is h bar k sub n. So we write all that out. We plug in what k sub n is. It's n pi over a. And you can say that you can see that the energy is easy to calculate for the infinite square. Well, it's just p squared over 2m. And it looks kind of intimidating as you see it written out there with all the h bars and the pi's and everything. But uh, it's actually not that bad. All right. Another important idea. Let's look at orthonormality. Orthonormality is the property that the stationary states have, that if you integrate psi star of one stationary state against psi of a different stationary state, or the same stationary state, you get 1 if n and m are the same. In other words, psi star psi uh, for any single n is always 1. It's normalized. But if n and m are different, you get 0. So that delta nm there has a name. It's called the Kronecker delta. It, uh, it just is shorthand that says it's 1 when n is equal to m, and it's 0 when n is not equal to m. Okay, so what good is that? Well, it's good when we're talking about wave functions that are superpositions of stationary states. We'll see in a minute that uh, useful wave functions or real wave functions in the real world are, are never exactly eigenstates, but they're usually superpositions of eigenstates. So let's... Uh, Let's look at that. We have a wave function that's a little bit of psi 1 plus a little bit of psi 2 plus, who knows, some other uh, contributions. The thing on the left is a general wave function. That's, uh, you know, some wave function that's been set up in the laboratory, say. And the things on the right are stationary states. So the idea is we're writing out a general wave function as a superposition of stationary states. Now let's say we want to normalize this general wave function. How are we going to do that? Well, we're going to have to calculate psi star psi and integrate it over all of x. Well, if you plug in the definition of the general wave function, you can see that that uh, looks pretty hairy. It's the integral of the superposition star times the superposition, the original superposition, and then integrate it over all x. But let's the cool thing about integrals over all x and, and these sums is that it doesn't matter if you integrate the sum or you sum the integrals. So we can re swap out the order of summation and integration. And you'll notice what I've got over there on the right is the integral of psi star sub n times psi of m. Well, that's exactly the orthonormality integral. And we know what that one turns out to be. It's delta nm. That means it's 1 if n is equal to m and 0 everywhere else. So the whole sum over m, only one term counts. It's the one where m is equal to n. And so that means I can throw out all the m's and just write that as uh, cn star cn, because the m where m is equal to n is the only one that counts. But of course, that's just the nth coefficient multiplied by its complex conjugate, which of course is just the magnitude of the nth coefficient squared. So what we just figured out is that the, the integral of psi star psi is just the sum of the squares of the coefficients. That's really cool. How do we figure out what the coefficients are? Well, we can rewrite the sum, and then we'll do something crazy. 
We'll multiply each side of the sum by psi star sub n and integrate over all x. Notice that on the left, that's an integral that if I know the general wave function I'm trying to represent, it's a function that I know. But on the right, I've got psi star n multiplied by all these other stationary states. Again, I can uh, expand that out and integrate. The sum of integrals is an integral of sums. Uh, backwards. An integral of a sum is the sum of the integrals. So I can, and the c sub n's are just constant numbers. So I can write that out as a series of integrals of n on 1, n on 2, n on n, and so on. But of course we know that n on 1 is 0 and n on 2 is 0. The only one that counts is the one where n is multiplied by n because of orthonormality. And that means that the, uh, the result of that sum is just c sub n. So that's really cool too. So the, so the answer is the way you figure out the nth coefficient is to multiply the wave function you're trying to represent with the superposition by the nth stationary state complex conjugate and integrate over all x. And that will give you a number which is the value of the nth coefficient. The last issue is how do I figure out what the wave function does in time? And then we go back to the Einstein relation, and you just notice that each term in the superposition corresponds to a particular energy eigenstate, and each term corresponds to an amplitude that rotates at a different rate. So to get the full time dependence of the wave function, we simply multiply each term by the corresponding phase factor that goes with that energy. And that's really all there is to it. And in fact, you could say that that is all there is to quantum mechanics uh, in, at, at some level. It, um, we're going to find out that there are more problems than the infinite square well to worry about. But that the general principle that we break wave functions down into stationary states, and each stationary state rotates with the frequency that, cor that uh, corresponds to its energy, uh, that really is about all there is to it. Okay, what we're going to do now is look at a little VPython demo that to illustrate some of these ideas using the uh, three-dimensional phasers that we've been talking about. And then when you get to class, you're actually going to calculate the Fourier coefficients or the, the linear superposition coefficients for an example where the particle starts on the left half of an infinite square well and then the wave function evolves in time from that initial condition. All right. Okay, so here we are looking at the ground state of the infinite square well wave function again, and you can see it, it rotates with a frequency omega. Now, we looked at this a little bit last time. I just wanted to point out something that I neglected to when we last spoke, and that is if you add the uh, first excited state, n equals 2, which has 4 times the energy, and then look at the um, probability distribution that sloshes back and forth. I wanted to point out something about the frequency of sloshing. The, uh, as the ground state goes around once, the first excited state goes around 4 times, but the frequency of the sloshing is three times every time the ground state goes around once. Let's watch that. Starting at the top word left, left, that's one time, two times, and then three times. So it did it three times. If you go into the frame of reference in which the ground state is stationary and watch uh, what happens, you'll see why that is. In that frame of reference, the um, first excited state is now going around with the frequency 3 omega 1 instead of 4 omega 1 and the sloshing happens every time the first excited state passes through the same uh, passes through the plane of the of the ground state so the interesting point is that the sloshing frequency is the difference in frequency between the ground state and the first excited state. This has relevance because if you have an electron making a transition from the excited state to the ground state its charge density is going to slosh just like this, and that charge density is going to radiate with the frequency equal to the difference in frequency between the two states. And that's just the right frequency so that the energy of the radiated photon is equal to the energy difference between the two states.
Okay, so that's how that works. This is a slightly different demo where uh, we can look at the ground state, the first excited state, the let's look at the next third excited state. Now notice that they have different amplitudes. It turns out I've picked coefficients for these states that are just right to confine the particle to the left half of the well if I added an infinite number of them together. Of course, I only have seven here. So if you go, um, let's see, one, two, three, four turns out to not contribute at all. We'll find out why when we solve the board work problem today in class. Five, six, and seven. Eight also doesn't contribute at all, so uh, it's not included. If I add uh, all these states together, and watch them go. Let's look what they look like. You can see that each of them is spinning with its own frequency. Each state rotates with a frequency that corresponds to its energy. Now remember the energy of the stationary states of the infinite square well go like n squared. So that means the ground state is 1, first excited state is 4, and then you go 9, uh, 16, and so on, 25, 36, 49. So it turns out the seventh excited state, which is the, I forget which color that is, let's see, that is the purple, it's going around 49 times every time the ground state goes around once. But if I add them all back in again, you can see how they go. Let's look at the superposition. That's the superposition, that's the full quantum state of all those guys added together. So you can see it, it looks kind of crazy. But uh, if we turn off the time and reset so that we're looking at t equals zero, you'll notice that indeed, go ahead and turn off all the individual components, the particle is pretty well confined to the left edge of the well. Now it's not perfect. If you'll notice, there is a little bit over here that's not confined to the left edge of the well, but that's only because I've only added seven terms. If I added more terms, many more terms, uh, then on the left I'd have a square it would look like a square wave, it would be a flat top, and it would go suddenly to zero, and I have zero over here. But because I only have seven terms in my sum, it doesn't quite make it. But uh, if I turn on the time, you'll notice that the wave function goes crazy. And uh, But the other thing I want to point out is that if you wait until the ground state wave function goes through one full cycle, let's see if we can see that. I'll go ahead and bump it up here. When it gets to one full cycle, right about there, the wave function returns to its original look. So this thing is periodic. And if you look at the Fourier expansion, if you look at the coefficients and see what happens when the ground state goes through one full cycle, you'll see that this is exactly what you'd expect. All right. So here's our first example of a real wave function that starts out. It's not a stationary state, obviously. It's a superposition state. But you can see what happens to the, uh, to the total wave function. What about the probability? The probability dances around, similar way. Again, if you wait till the ground state wave function gets back to its uh, original orientation, let's see if we can do it here, you're going to find that the probability is all confined to the left-hand side. It repeats. And that's how it works. All right.